looks like we have 86 attendees already online and more will be coming in. Uh, so I'd say we go ahead and get started uh, right away. Uh, so first off, I uh, want to welcome everyone uh, to our very first kickoff event for Black History Month. Uh, my name is Larry Alade. I work for the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woodsaw, and I'm one of the co-chairs for Black History Month. Uh, just a few basic mechanics for the meeting uh, to our audience. Please note that your audio will be muted and videos turned off. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself by using the chat function. Uh, I think it's a great way to connect with people as the event is going. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any point during the event through the Q&A function. Uh, we are saving questions at, to the, at the end of the panel discussion if there's time. Uh, we have members of the facilitation team who are monitoring the chat and will be fielding questions. So before uh, we get started with our program, I would like to turn over the mic to uh, Dr. Robert Thieler, uh, the director of the USGS Woods Hole Coastal and Marine Center and chair of the Woods Hole Diversity Initiative, who will be given offering, who will be offering some brief remarks. Hi, thanks, Larry. Uh, good afternoon. Again, my name is Rob Thieler. I'm the Center Director of the U.S. Geological Survey's Coastal Marine Science Center here in Woods Hole and currently the chair of the Woods Hole Diversity Initiative. Welcome to the Woods Hole Scientific Community's 40th celebration of Black History Month. In 2004, the leaders of the six Woods Hole Science Institutions, the Marine Biological Laboratory, NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center, Sea Education Association, USGS, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the Woodwell Climate Research Center signed a memorandum committing our institutions to work together to attract and retain a more diverse workforce. <coughs> that memorandum established the Woods Hole Scientific Community Diversity Initiative, which in turn established the Diversity Advisory Committee to support the institutions in their efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in and among the DI institutions, as well as the wider Woods Hole, Falmouth, Cape Cod and Islands communities, and increasingly, due to moving things online during the pandemic, the nation and the world. On behalf of the Diversity Initiative, I'd like to thank our local virtual host, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee, and especially the Advisory Committee's Black History Month Committee that Larry co-chaired for putting together another outstanding series of events through the course of the month. Thank you again for attending today. I'm pleased to turn things back over to Dr. Larry Alade to introduce today's program. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Thieler. So before we jump into today's program, I thought I'll share a few remarks regarding uh, Woods Hole Black History Month. Uh, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Woods Hole Black History Month celebrations, and we could have not asked for a much better way to start the month by commemorating such a special event. While the theme for this year focuses on identity, representation, and diversity of the Black family, today we're going to slightly pivot our focus on a special panel discussion that explores the 40 years of Black History Month in the Woods Hall. And the title is The Journey and the Future. I want to extend my thanks to my co-chair, Angie Scott Price, and to the Black History Month Committee, as well as many friends of the Black History Month Committee who all did an incredible job delivering our programming this year, especially during this challenging time. In the face of ongoing struggles and challenges that many of us faced over the last 10 months, either from the pandemic, the civil unrest, the contentious elections, to the installation of a new administration, the Woods Hole Scientific Community more than ever recognizes the value of this event in building a stronger community through diversity. I'd like to acknowledge the six uh, research institutions, including the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Marine Biological Laboratory, the Northeast Fishery Science Center, the USGS Coastal and Marine Center, the Woodswell Climate Center, formerly known as the Woods Hole Research Center, and Sea Education, who all sponsor this program with annual contributions through the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee. With that said, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's uh, panel discussion, Dr. Ambrose Gerald, who started his career as one of the first Black fishery biologists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He was a marine biologist at the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole for nearly four decades. Uh, during his career, Ambrose Jarrett led an array of efforts to increase diversity in fisheries uh, and related fields. To name a few, he was the first chair of the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee to promote diversity across the six scientific institutions in Woods Hole. 
He was the founder of the Partnership Education Program and was director of the program for many years before he retired. In 2017, the Woods Hole Scientific Community launched an annual lectureship named in Dr. Gerald's honor. The lecture series named after, his, after him reflects his career-long commitment to increasing diversity in, environment, in the environmental sciences and fisheries-related sciences. To many of us, Dr. Ambrose Gerald is an educator, a mentor, and a friend. And without further ado, I introduce our moderator, our moderator for today's panel, Dr. Ambrose Gerald. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and uh, good afternoon to family, friends, and um, old colleagues or continuing colleagues, and uh, to all who have joined us today for this uh, special occasion and uh, that we've been now, as you've heard, uh, been uh, at for better than 40 years. Uh, as you can imagine, things start out informally and then become formal. And you will hear about that today. And I think in light of time, uh, Larry, I thank you for that introduction, but I believe what I'm gonna ask the panelists to do is in their own way, uh, say who they are as we go up through the uh, uh, event today, uh, rather than my read their bios. Uh, Brad Brown, who is with us, uh, uh, is, Brad Brown recruited me to, uh, to Woods Hole, I'll say that. Jarita Davis and I were colleagues while I was still there. Jarita is a poet and an author, in addition to what she does uh, for the National Ocean Atm Atm Atmospheric Administration. Lina Hall, who I think is joining us, uh, had a long career at the Marine Biological Laboratory and chaired the uh, Woods Hole Black History Month uh, committee for uh, 10 years or more. And we have expanded our presentations or presenters to Bergen, Norway. Margaret M. Cube, Mary McBride uh, is an old uh, friend, colleague, and, and she is perhaps on this call today, the person who is most responsible for initiating uh, Black History Month uh, celebration in Woods Hole. Uh, she's a scientist there, and, and, uh, and she was a scientist when she was in Woods Hole, uh, found their way from Mobile through California to Brandeis to Woods Hole. So uh, welcome panelists, uh, and I would like to uh, initiate the, con the discussion here um, more than a presentation uh, style of panelists. And um, and ask um, starting out with uh, the what is the significance of Black History Month and why is it important and and of course with that um, how did we get started in Woods Hole and um, Margaret would you like to uh, start out well. I can, I can uh, do that. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's very nice to see you, uh, Ambrose, Brad, uh, again. And it's nice to meet, you know, my uh, fellow panelists. Um, well, it was a sign of the times, I think, uh, Ambrose, because uh, uh, in the uh, mid 1970s, there was a lot going on socially. Uh, the uh, um, black power movement was uh, in effect, uh, but uh, the uh, Negro History Week had uh, started uh, as early as uh, 1926 and uh, with um, the historian uh, Carter Woodson um, trying to uh, ameliorate the uh, inadequate uh, education that uh, students were receiving about, uh, about uh, Black history. But uh, then um, it became uh, something else uh, um, mid 1970s. Um, the um, President Ford uh, formally acknowledged uh, Black History Month, and um, it was also uh, something that was uh, uh, initiated by uh, the um, 
what's it called? The um, Kent State University um, Black students had uh, had uh, started the Black History Month celebration also. And uh, so that was the time I started there in 1975. And so that was the time um, when that was all happening. And uh, I think that um, we uh, felt uh, a need, um, not just uh, because we were somewhat isolated, you know, being, uh, I would say, fish out of water, uh, pardon the pun. Um, but um, we had, um, we were struggling to some extent to uh, achieve um, um, re respect and recognition. Um, um, and I think that a lot of the uh, traditionally uh, white uh, scientists uh, really questioned our presence there. So um, we, uh, we uh, decided that uh, we wanted to celebrate Black History Month. And uh, I think that it started out initially with the uh, Harambe um, celebration, but uh, rapidly uh, extended to uh, become a series of lectures meant to uh, educate uh, people um, uh, in, in the Wutul community about uh, the accomplishments <coughs> that Black people had to uh, had contributed to uh, the marine sciences. Yeah, I think, Margaret, uh, what I recall too is uh, as we move from an in from a very informal uh, uh, commemoration among ourselves in many ways uh, and friends that uh, were not black, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. that it, it was over at the Endeavor House where the Woods Hole Exhibit Center now is uh, on School Street there. Yes. And uh, we started out with the soul food potluck. Uh, <laughs> and then I remember Linda Patanjo bringing her potluck soul food Polish dish, you know, and what have you. So uh, yes, uh, and, 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 uh, and then we obviously moved into uh, then starting, uh, you know, a more formal um, recognition when we were finding ways to uh, bring the institutions themselves into the celebration. And, and that might be a good segue for um, uh, Brad to offer something about what was going on uh, from a more institutional uh, perspective. Well, thank you, Ambrose. Uh, am, am I on? I'm unmuted now. Yes. No, we hear you. Okay. No, uh, it, 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 the beginning of, of course, the federal approval of Black History Month came, as Margaret said, with the proclamation of President Ford. And so Noah had actually, by 1980, actually had Washington events on Black History Month. So uh, it, it was obviously something that uh, in order to be effective in terms of the inclusion side of it, it had to be adopted officially and supported by the institutions. So we recognized uh, initially in fisheries that uh, this was uh, a very important step that had come up from the, our employees, the people, our scientists who've been working there and uh, it should get support and it did get support. And we were able to also realize, of course, that Black History Month is, is and Black history is not something just for those people who are of African descent. It is integral to understanding the history of the United States and the history of the world. And so the speakers and the uh, programs that were put on were such that they were uh, really, uh, I think, changed the way that uh, many people who attended had been brought up to look at history. I certainly got a very biased view of history in uh, my high school history. 
back in the 1950s. Uh, and this correction was uh, uh, an important part of what Black History Month uh, still does. Uh, and so uh, we were, I was very happy to be supportive of an effort to have it become more formalized and have the backing of the of, of our director, Bob Edwards, uh, and the uh, then later all of the other institutions that came on board as well. Thank you, Brad. And, and you know, what I would take privilege here to say also is that as we move into uh, more formalizing the program, we certainly were, were looking at the history of Blacks in Woods Hole. And of course, the uh, uh, person, uh, you know, most uh, foremost was Dr. Ernest Everett Juss, who had spent uh, many years there uh, in uh, starting in the 20s. Uh, and, and of course, uh, then we moved toward bringing in speakers. And so in about 1979 or 80, our first uh, uh, speaker uh, or presenter uh, on Black uh, history, so to say, was Dr. Kenneth Manning, who is a professor and was a professor at MIT. And at the time, he was about two years out from publishing his book, Black Apollo of Science, about Ernest Everett Jess's uh, life, and particularly as a scientist as a, and in Woods Hole. And so he was our very first uh, a presenter. And then uh, uh, when we, if we look at the records that we have now, uh, which you can find online on the website, uh, our, uh, one of our first speakers also was Dr. Herman Branson, who's a physicist, was a physicist. Uh, he was president of Lincoln University and a little anecdote, note, uh, he uh, worked with Linus Paulin uh, in the early uh, uh, days in terms of before the double helix came out. And, and uh, he came in uh, at that time to talk about ways that the scientific and technical laboratories uh, could more effectively utilize black college student resources. So that was tapping in also to what was going on in maybe more formalized ways of, of finding talent of appreciating uh, contributions and 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 the, the what uh, others could offer to, so to say, uh, the scientific endeavor. And I want to say before I forget, also we have later on in the uh, the month, uh, Dr. Uh, Walter e. Massey is going to be interviewed uh, by Mindy Todd. Uh, but Dr. Massey was our speaker in 1989. And while he was president of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. And at that time, his talk was based on the question, Blacks in science, who needs them? And so um, I want to bring that in, in the sense that we're talking about Black history, uh, you know, in a Catholic or universal sense, but we all ways had a focus on blacks in science. And, and so we were wanting to bring, uh, you know, uh, expertise and intellect and, and thinking about uh, how we needed to continue the social experiment of uh, uh, bringing those into uh, science that had been left out before. Uh, so that's all part of it. And so you can imagine 40 years um, and, and then we'll go and, and talk about certainly uh, what um, this meant to the wider community at large and its part in um, uh, galvanizing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the recognition of black history. And I'd, I'd like to inject here for Dr. Davis uh, and ask, um, you know, you came uh, and then 
using and and building on your background as a poet, as a writer, uh, author. Um, and, and I can recall you bringing in, and we at that time, perhaps focusing a lot on poets and what poets could bring uh, to the message about black history and about moving forward. So would you like to uh, chime in here and, uh, and, 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 and offer some perspective? Sure, certainly. Um, so I have a humanities background. I have a PhD in English literature and creative writing. And a lot of the people who I know, the scholars and academics um, are in the humanities. So certainly poets, writers um, wrote about their experiences. And I thought that would be add a little bit of um, maybe texture to some of the, the lectures that we are having. But in addition, there were um, historians and anthropologists and, um, you know, to give some kind of context to um, Black history, I maybe I hadn't been made aware that it was supposed to be specifically sci hard sciences, um, but I was thinking of Black History Month as a way to share some of Black history and culture with a community that has almost no exposure to it. Um, oh, should I introduce myself first? I realize that I haven't. So my name is Jerita Davis. I've worked at NOAA Fisheries for 15 years as a science editor. Um, so that's how I ended up in the scientific community, even though I have this humanities background. And um, yeah, when I came on board and saw that there is a Black History Month, my first thought was, really? Because um, before I arrived in Woods Hole, I looked up the demographics and saw that there were um, fewer than 10 African Americans uh, that were listed as living in Woods Hole. And when I brought this to Ambrose and to some other Black people who are living currently in the area, I thought they would be like, yeah, that's crazy small number. But instead they said, God, how did they get that many, eight? And they're trying to count on their fingers the eight Black people they knew who could have been counted as living in Woods Hole. So, um, <laughs> but the good thing about Black History Month is, and I think Brad Brown had mentioned this, and I'll echo this, is that, you know, African Americans or people, Black people, however you want to identify yourself, um, we celebrate Black history all year round. 365 days a year, we're always celebrating Black History Month. So February isn't really so much for us as it is to share with everyone else um, some of the wonderful things that are part of being Black, his, uh, being Black in America. And I think that I loved the lectures um, because it was more than just fun facts. I think a lot of places celebrate Black History Month by telling you a fun fact like, potato chips were invented by a black man. Well, that's great. But this was a more in-depth, you know, hour-long lecture, Q&A, and it really added to it. So yes, I um, knew a lot of folks who, like um, Dr. Courtney Baker, writes about images of violence throughout history, of American history against blacks. So whether it's like lynchings or some of the like terrible, um, difficult situations um, that are almost gory and how it's sort of a fascination in American culture to have these black bodies being mutilated. So there are talks like that that weren't scientific, but maybe more um, social, more um, um, cultural. And I thought that added another dimension, a little bit of depth. And I hope that people enjoyed it. Some folks after a talk would say to me, oh, I felt like I was back in college. I was really, you know, you know, thinking of a new perspective and thinking about, I don't know, how slavery came to Brazil and how they actually changed the definition of race in order to maintain slavery in Brazil. So that's nothing to do with science specifically, but it definitely, they were conversation starters and people were thinking about the experience of being Black in America. Thank you, sure. Rita. And, and, and I think that that uh, leads us to, to maybe swing back as we then eventually move into the Harambee 
but uh, about uh, the impact and not just impact, but how the wider community uh, help bring impact. Uh, and, and so uh, Margaret, Brad, uh, Dorita, whomever step in here uh, and help us uh, see what was going on because I, my thinking is, you know, we recall that uh, when we got this going, we immediately connected with, but actually what was going on to some degree in the public school with some of the black teachers there and administrators and, and, and the NAACP and what was going on on Cape Cod, the Upper Cape, for example, you know, trying to get black teachers up there. Uh, so there's so much connected to uh, how this was a galvanizing uh, event. I, for example, came to Cape Cod with uh, no knowledge other than I had been in college with one person that I knew was of Cape Verdean descent, but really hadn't focused on uh, Cape Verde. Uh, and, and even though uh, I looked at the, uh, the, the history of what was going on, uh, moving from colonialization to independence in Cape Verde was one of those places. But here, this looking at the black diaspora or it, the African diaspora, uh, I mean, the, how this thing was so galvanizing for the local Cape Verdean community as well as all other uh, persons here, whether it was from the Caribbean, uh, starting in my household uh, to, uh, uh, you know, Africa or here in, across the States or Brazil, wherever. So let's talk about um, the, the wider community and how um, it in, the impacts that we've had uh, in um, you know, uh, uh, looking at Black history, and hopefully what it's done to help uh, Woods Hole uh, scientific community become a better uh, and more welcoming community. Well, I'll give a crack at that, uh, Ambrose. Uh, and they, the way they do to get unmuted here. You want to unmute me? No, you're, you're good, Brad. We, we, Go we can hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, it very much was uh, interesting to look at what was happening in the wider community. The, uh, and particularly, obviously, the largest number of people of African descent in the area were people who had come from the Cape Verde Islands. And, but when they had come from the Cape Verde Islands, it was a Portuguese colony. So they came uh, into this country being stamped as Portuguese. But in 1975, Cape Verde became independent and joined the African Union, of course, as an African country. So all of a sudden, their home country changed from a Portuguese country to uh, an African country. And in addition, they, they in one sense, they had a, uh, whereas most African Americans, when they had looked earlier in the 60s, when the other countries in Africa, other than the Portuguese colonies, had become independent, uh, there was a generic connection, but not a personal one. But in the revolution in the 70s, the leading African uh, uh, independence fighter was uh, Cabral, who I think probably half of the Cape Verdeans in Falmouth could claim as some kind of a relative. And so mm -hmm. when he spoke at the United Nations, there was a, a, a resurgence of a different sort of pride in that community. And that dovetailed with uh, the opportunity that the Harambe particularly provided itself for people of Cape Verdean ancestry to bring their uh, culture mixing with the larger, broader, uh, African-American cultures that had come into the scientific community and been a small, smaller presence 
of course, on Cape Cod all the way back to the 1600s. Uh, so I think, and we, the NAACP, which got started in the Cape on the mid or early 1960s, had really began to uh, it, it, it expanded looking at Cape situations by 1970s, whereas in the early years, their major focus was in getting the civil rights bills passed that ended uh, segregation in the South. So they, uh, they, this, um, they had started a, an, a real effort to get uh, with the local school system to get them to recruit uh, black teachers. Uh, my wife at that time came, worked in uh, Barnesville Middle School in Hyannis and started a Black History Month uh, uh, effort there. Let me get this foolish phone out of the way. Okay. Uh and, and, and okay. so just, uh, but I, I can't help but mention uh, the NAACP's work with Bourne, uh, the Upper Cape Vogue, because Ambrose mentioned it. Uh, that hit uh, the Boston newspapers through the NAACP when uh, they published a yearbook that used the term porch monkeys in it. And that opened up a, a whole can of worms in terms of opening up the opportunities for people to truly participate in uh, throughout the Upper Cape Boat region in the offerings of the, that that school had to offer. And so that changes were being made. So there was a, 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 a spirit of change in, on the Cape in the area that uh, the Black History Month provided a, a focal point and a guidance point for, and a rallying point for the wider community. Thank you, Bray. Um, uh, and I see uh, what I would like to, uh, is picking up on the Harambe, uh, uh, Lionel Hall. Uh, Lionel, as I said, uh, has a long history there at the Marine Biological Laboratories for his place of employment, but was very instrumental and key in again galvanizing this wider community. And so Lionel, when we think about the Harambe, uh, in addition to it was an opportunity to bring the family together uh, to and the families look forward to it given the time of day it was purposely offered at that time of day so it wasn't just for the uh, Woods Hole uh, people who could fit it in during their day and go back to their labs or to their offices or whatever right. but we it was set up so that uh, we could now bring in the wider community and they came in with all those dishes but then we had all those storytellers for the children uh, and we had the uh, pre the musicians the per persons of all parts of the arts but so from your point of view um, it, tell us a bit about the uh, Harambe and and it's it's and and, and putting the Harambe on well, thank you and welcome um, and hello. I'm glad I finally caught up to you guys. Um, yeah, the uh, I guess the Harambe and all of the functions and all of the community outreach it, it did hit home for me, or it was the perfect storm for me. So working at MBL, I'm I'm not a scientist. I was a um, an administrator, so to speak. But uh, basically, to be a part of the program, to learn about the scientific impact and the speakers in the in the the past history of the program so i basically got in on the perfect wave uh, you know it had, the program had been running for years without me and i just happened to have the opportunity to come in and, and be a member of that but the harambe was a big special part for me because i believe ambrose has started off when i was just uh, a wee member on the committee or a new member of the committee you used to send me out to go get um 
pots and stuff, dishes that people would prepare. Oh yeah, so that was that was part of my my Harambe day in Black History Month. So I would be running around Falmouth, uh, on sit Bobby Odin to get the ribs and things like yeah. that. <laughs> so those that and that endeared us. Bobby never came, and God rest his soul, he passed away on us. But those were the things that, and that Napoleon, <laughs> and Napoleon, and and uh, and Reuben Davis, who who. Yeah. So, the ribs, the ribs. Yeah, Ruben with the ribs, right? So they always had an ongoing competition. Those guys, but the, yeah. I, I liked Bobby's. But uh, no, the um, the functions and the reach out, the outreach to the community that was already, like I said, had already begun. But it gave me a chance to reach out to other folks and, you know, younger folks. I, I thought my thing was is that you know I would see a lot of parents there of people of friends of mine. And I said, my parents are here, but where's your son? Where's your niece? Where's your daughter? Where, you know, so it was a good push that there, you know, that I tried then. Um, once again, it just, when you say the bigger outreach in the community. So you had George Spivey and us um, all with the concerned black men, um, which I think sprang from, you know, the NAACP. It just all of those organizations being there or the nucleus of us, being participants in that stuff was just great. And Woods Hole was a place that people didn't feel like they, uh, wow, there's, there's Blacks in Woods Hole, uh, you know, as Jarita was mentioning, you know, uh, or there are black, Blacks on Cape Cod, at least, you know, I mean, I was in the military and I would meet people and they go like, so where are you from? I said, well, Cape Cod. And they go like, well, give me the nearest city. I said, well, Boston. Oh, we know where you are now, but Cape <laughs> Cod and, and Blacks didn't, you know, relate to them. They were going, I don't know anybody down on the Cape. So it was kind of interesting. But um, the Harambe was a special time. I enjoyed it. Uh, it it uh, the entertainers, the speakers, the day, you know, that we'd have in the MIGS room and then going into the, to the cafeteria and things like that. Uh, just reaching all the people, black, white, red, yellow, scientists, non-scientists, the community, um, the Cape Verdean community that, that yeah. you know, I'm still wondering sometimes whether they feel they're black or white or in between, but we're all one. And it was a great opportunity for them to, to bring their dishes, to have fun, to understand uh, what Black History, History Month was really about, because I was just amazed at how many of my friends and some of their families just didn't participate in what I felt was the only program on Cape Cod, which is the uh, the Woods Hole Black History Month program. Yeah, thank you, Lionel. And and I I just like to add, you know, back in the day and when we got started and on into it to the middle. We, uh, I think about, we had a strong black middle class here. Uh, persons who had worked at the highest levels that this country has to offer had retired or had homes here. I remember the girl, the, the godmothers uh, uh, organization of black <laughs> women, uh, the, the doers, an organization of black men. And I remember the, uh, I'm trying to call the group out of, of Martha's Vineyard. I mean, the folks from Martha's Vineyard from the school system were very supportive. They came every year, they presented uh, from uh, Barnstable, you had John Reed and, and the, the teachers and families out of there. And then, you know, Verd Williams up out of, and, and Rose Merritt out of uh, Bourne. So you had that kind of mixture going on and, 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 and yet we were bringing people to come in and to talk about black history and, and, and how to diversify the science enterprise. And, and so uh, while there were times that we thought, wow, we have all of this uh, interest and participation from folks far and wide uh, we still somehow try to keep, well, how do you get the folks in Woods Hole to come out of their laboratories or out of their buildings to participate in this? Now, that's not to suggest that there weren't some, because there were. And the thing about the uh, celebration itself, it became a very diverse group of people dedicated. I think of Phil and Nan Logan, for example, and uh, of... Uh, of uh, Steve Clark and, and so many who 
gave of their time and efforts and and from the heart, you know, that that really made it a, a galvanizing event. But I, I also want to inject here too, so we not forget, or at least it's my opinion and perspective, as far as I know, the Woods Hole Black History Month uh, uh, activities, uh, when uh, they became formalized, it, it was the first uh, such uh, endeavor to bring the Woods Hole uh, scientific institutions together on anything. And, and so I may be corrected on that, but I believe that's the case. If I look at what is going on in, um, in this, uh, uh, if I look at what's going on in um, today with our diversity, equity, and inclusion and welcoming efforts, um, we have, if you've heard here, the diversity initiative made up of the uh, the six institutions and the heads of those institutions. Uh, and, and the uh, chair of that committee introduced the session today. Um, this is all out of this recognition of Black History Month uh, and what uh, we need to do in whatever way we can to bring awareness, respect, and presence uh, to wherever we are uh, in in these uh, United States and its territories, and and so um, I, I think that you know if we, if if history is kind to us, it it cannot overlook that uh, that what I believe that together we have done for this community, and we're still there, um, still trying to be uh, part of the community, still trying to get in persons who come to help lead these institutions as well uh, to, to, to lead us into the light, so to say. Now, I don't want to get on a, uh, start preaching here a, a soapbox, but here again, um, it, I want to go back to uh, Margaret, everyone, Dorita, uh, the, committed, the, the, the panel here. Um, in terms of the programming, uh, in your minds, you know, what kinds of things were uh, we uh, trying to do or wrestling with in terms of, you know, uh, I, I recall, for example, we relied on the, as far as the theme of the, the, the uh, month, uh, we relied on the Association for the Study of uh, African American Life and History uh, and, and from the wider uh, perspective of what to focus on, but yet we were constrained by the institution saying, well, if we put up our money, you got to bring us people to come in here and talk about science or present their science. So we had those kind of balances to, to attend with. Uh, anyone want to uh, chime in here? Don't be bashful. Rita? Yeah, I'll speak. Okay. Lottie, you're here. Uh, yeah. Join us. You're, you're, you're Perhaps. Here. Paul, let Rita go and I can certainly follow up. Oh, sure. Um, so again, I hadn't realized all of those pressures from the scientific institutions asking for, for, for more science. I was thinking of it as, um, you know, we are here and people don't always see us in this community. And um, while I have a lot of really great like one on one relationships with many people in the Woods Hole area, Falmouth area, Cape Cod in general. Um, what a lot of folks don't always understand is that when a community is so homogeneous for so long, that's by design, right? That's not just by accident. So if we want to um, create the diversity that we talk about, if we want to increase the, the pool of knowledge that we're reaching from um, and not just have it be the same kinds of scientists that we see over and over again, that also has to be by design. 
And so I thought that uh, sort of a cultural understanding of some of the implications of what folks think like, oh, well, there are just aren't enough black scientists out there to hire. Well, that's simply not true. We, those of us who are black, who are in this field, we know, all know that there are black scientists who could be hired. So, I mean, to, it has a real impact on whether or not our community can be diversified. I know there are people who have come and left, who have come and stayed for maybe five years. And then they just said, you know what, this is just too hard. This is just too um, emotionally trying and stressful. They've gotten pushback at work. Um, there, I was on the library board at the Woods Hole Library and someone's wife asked me, what brought you here um, to a concert they were having? And I was like, I'm on the board. And she was like, yeah, but what brought you here? Like this, this sense of you don't really belong here. And so I felt like that side needed to also be part of the discussion, um, in addition to highlighting the good science that African Americans have been doing for years. Um, but maybe, I don't know how useful or how much of an impact that made, but at least people were thinking about these issues um, and the effect that they have on human beings. Because at the end of the day, the scientists, they bring their families here. You bring your family here and, you know, your son is like, I don't know, pulled over for no reason or, you know, suspected of shoplifting because they just are not used to seeing black folks in the shop. Folks aren't going to want to live here, right? So I feel like that aspect of the community, the culture um, is unsuspectingly, like, I don't think anyone intentionally is, is picking out and saying, oh, you black girl on the library board, why do you exist in my community? <laughs> like it was genuine curiosity. She couldn't believe that I was there, but not realizing how much of an impact that has on someone. And I just stay out of stubbornness. Um, and then also, <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And also so that when new folks do come, like I was really heartbroken when some of these, um, I'm thinking of, of some black women specifically, I can think of three who came, had jobs, were in scientific fields, really were, you know, invested in, in doing well here, and then eventually just had to leave. So I'm here for the next one to try to convince them to stay and so that they have someone to call and say, should I be worried that, you know, I don't know, that an election just happened and should I stay home for a week? They're like, no, I think we're okay and let's hold. So that's the kind of thing you need to know that what the community is. So, all right, sorry, someone else, Larry, you were gonna say. Oh, thank you, Dr. Davis. That is uh, extremely right on, uh, you know, message from my point of view. Yeah, I think I'll add too, because uh, when we're thinking about programming and as chair of, Black, of the Black History Month committee, uh, one of the things that, you know, we often think about as the going back to the original question, the significance of like, you know, Black History Month. And so while we're doing it and not necessarily trying to fit within the pressures that, you know, that's being presented, uh, you know, to the committee itself. Uh, wanted to speculate and maybe build up a little bit from uh, what's been said earlier. And I think there's a lot of great points and I really enjoyed uh, the history that Margaret really lined out about, you know, how Black History Month came about where it started with the uh, Negro a week uh, by Carter Woodson. Uh, one of the things that I read and I was just surfing was like, you know, uh, Carter Woodson, he stated he, race has no history. Oh, you're breathing. If it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes, oh, can everyone hear me? Yes. You're chopping. Um, yeah. Okay. You were okay. okay. How's the audio and the video right now? I can shut yeah, my video yeah. off. Is that uh, causing problems? Now you're okay. good. Okay, excellent. So I want to pick up from a, a, a quote that I picked up from Carter G. Woodson, who stated, uh, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world. And, you know, when I really think about that quote, what it really tells me or what I take away from that, that there's no amount of legislation that one can grab one's equality if a society does not really value who you are or where you came from. So, 
you know, not to say that policy or legislation is not important. I mean, Martin Luther King stated that, you know, law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. Mm -hmm. Yes, that may be true. But while we've looked back over the last 10 to 11 months, we've seen how this has played out in the civil unrest throughout the whole nation and worldwide. So when we're thinking about Black History Month in terms of like the programming, you know, really think about, you know, going back to its purpose and trying to align it, of course, to the national theme. We try to be not prescriptive when we're designing our programs, but more so to really educate and to recognize what Brad said earlier, that this is American history. It's just not just Black history only we're sharing, as Jarita alluded to. So in my opinion, and now going back to the significance and importance of Black History Month in terms of our, you know, designing of the program, I think it's not only, you know, it's designed to educate, you know, about the struggles, the contributions and the achievements of African Americans, but I think it's also designed for us to be able to face the harsh truth if we want to really make a difference, if we want to make a change. I also think it's intended to break down, you know, the divide in nationality and teach universal love without distinct race, merit, or rank. And I think in my opinion, to achieve those, we have to recognize the dignity of one another to ensure equality for one another. So I think that when we look at what the values and the significance is, I think that, you know, it resonates in how we design our program and the time and the type of program we want to, you know, put out to the community at large. Yeah, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lottie. And, and we will go on, and I just want to point out that we have about eight more minutes, and I want to make sure that if there's anyone who uh, had something they wanted to um, uh, get in, that uh, we, we, we keep the time in mind. And I would just say that, uh, you know, thinking again about who we are, where we've come from, and, you know, what we uh, hope for Black History, History Month in the future. I, I think about some, all of it is just, you know, a good thing. But there's one thing that sticks out in my mind too about uh, this event. And, 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 and it was Mr. Phil Baboza. Mm -hmm. When he brought in that 30 mm -hmm. some piece band into the cafeteria at the Swope Center. And he had performed before that a, a, a couple of times with smaller groups or whatever. And when he connected that to uh, Count Basie and to Duke Ellington and, and Ella Fitzgerald, you name it, uh, uh, I said, all right, uh, I finally arrived mm -hmm. on Cape Cod. <laughs> I, got I said, I didn't know how far up south was until I got here. But when I heard Phil Baboza and that 30 some piece band, I said, orchestra, I said, Lord, have mercy. And so that, that's one thing I want to make sure I get in. And then uh, when Mother Bear came in from Mashpee, from the Wampanoags, and connected the history of Black America, African American, Native American, uh, in, in, uh, the impact that that made on me, everything that I'd ever learned or would come to learn about uh, Black history and, my, and, and here on Cape Cod, uh, that sticks out in my mind. So, you know, it, you know and then certainly uh, there, there's so much more, but uh, it, the way we connected uh, and are connecting the families here from all ethnic and sectors uh, is, is, is tremendous from my point of view. Uh, yeah. Let me amen, let me amen that Ambrose, um, because yeah. um, as you mentioned, the galvanizing effect that uh, the Black History Month um, activities and celebration have, uh, have generated, you know, um, it's something that uh, is, it, contributes to the sensitivity and, and the social tolerance that we so deeply need in this country now, because, um, you know, like it or not, and some don't like it, the United States is becoming more um, diverse, multi-ethnic, and multicultural. And uh, we're all here together. We're all in the same boat. And so when the storm is raging, as we can clearly see, 
in the recent recent events, um, and uh, the waters are turbulent. So uh, we can either uh, row the boat together and keep it afloat, or we can all go down with the ship. <laughs> but um, I'm, I was very taken by uh, Amanda Gorman's um, speech at the um, inauguration. Yeah, at the inauguration, and one line stuck out tremendously to me, and, and she said that we've seen a force that would rather shatter our nation than than share it. And um, that that uh, is something that uh, the Black History Month celebration um, has has uh, helped to remedy. You know, in terms of I think that the understanding um, and the appreciation for the diversity uh, between us um, or among us is uh, a key. You know, to being able to uh, to um, strengthen our communities and work together. So. Uh, that means that uh, Black History Month is something that's, that is, is um, valuable. And I uh, would encourage uh, any uh, culture to uh, try to celebrate its, uh, itself, you know, in the same way. Thank you. Am Ambrose? Yes, Brent, go on. Uh, you know, when I, I want to like to say something I think that how important it is and how important it is for the administrations of the institutions to support it. Uh, back in October there was a, a news item that went out on by Associated Press and it said racist graffiti found at Cape Cod's Lowell Holly Reservation in Mashpee. There were two dozen racist messages, including Trump 2020, bring back slavery, whites only, Cape Cod KKK has over 10,000 members. There is no one in any other background that we people who are leaders and administrators who bring and hire to come to work on Cape Cod that has to consider that they can take a pleasant walk in a state reservation and enjoy the natural beauty of the area and run into something like this. And that's why it is so important then when something like this comes up, that all of the institutions continue to support it and build it and reach out so that it reaches an ever widening ray wave, uh, uh, like a, a ripples from a puddle in a thrown in the water, including not just those of African descent, but all of those who live there and share the space of Cape Cod. Thank you, Brad. And I, at this time, uh, we have about a minute. I'm gonna turn it back over to the uh, Woods Hole uh, Chair, uh, Dr. Alati. Thank you, Ambrose. Mm -hmm. And thank you everyone for such a live discussion. And unfortunately, we're running out of time and you know, we wish we could have take some questions, but I think there's been some really great lively discussion today and perhaps maybe an opportunity we can follow up, you know, maybe through our website. First of all, I want to thank our moderator, Dr. Ambrose, did a fantastic job. And I also want to thank, thank uh, our panelists today who participated uh, in today's discussion. I just want to briefly highlight that we got some more programming uh, coming uh, through the month of February next week. We have an interview with Dr. Massey with Mindy Todd. You do not want to miss that interview. It's going to be uh, an amazing uh, interview based on his recent memoir, In the Eye of the Storm. Uh, February 17th, we have an all women panel discussion uh, on the work of a Boston columnist, Janae Osterhold, on the be beautiful resistance. And we also uh, from the Ernest Just Foundation. So stay tuned, uh, details to be determined. And finally, I wanted to also uh, 
you know, bring to everyone's attention that, you know, while we can't do the in-person Harambe this year, we actually, uh, the community came up with the idea to do a virtual Harambe. And so this is going to be a month long event. Visit our website, the Woods Hole Black History Month, and there you will find a number of uh, recipes that you can take on and try out. And also we ask, ask you or welcome you to share some recipes as well. So other than that, I want to thank everyone. I think this has been a fantastic discussion and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.